Hey, welcome back Freedom Lovers and in this video we're going to be reviewing two very very dangerous movies and we're going to be seeing why they are so dangerous. As a matter of fact for Roots we're going to look into Thomas Sowell's analysis, breakdown and review of the accuracy of the movie compared to actual historical accounts and I'm going to share my own personal devastating experience with the recently released from 2022 Hollywood movie The Woman King and I'm telling you it's painful but we're going to get into that so without any more waste of time let's dive right in and see what Dr. Sowell has to say about the Hollywood machine for propaganda. Contrary to the myths to live by, created by Alex Haley and others, Africans were by no means the innocents portrayed in Roots, baffled as to why white men were coming in and taking their people away in chains. On the contrary, the region of West Africa from which Kunta Kinte supposedly came was one of the great slave trading regions of the continent, before, during, and after the white man arrived. It was Africans who enslaved their fellow Africans, selling some of these slaves to Europeans or to Arabs and keeping others for themselves. No, I think this is perhaps the closest link where these two movies come together because the region cited where Kunta Kinte supposedly came from is quite similar to the Benin area where the supposed Daome warriors from the movie The Woman King actually existed and that is present day Benin. Is it just a mere coincidence? Maybe. Or maybe not. Even at the peak of the Atlantic slave trade, Africans retained more slaves for themselves than they sent to the Western Hemisphere. This pattern was not confined to West Africa, from which most slaves were sent to the Western Hemisphere. In East Africa, the Maasai were feared slave raiders, and other African tribes, either alone or in conjunction with Arabs, enslaved their more vulnerable neighbors. As late as 1891, it was reported that Manuema slavers had demoralized surrounding tribes, destroying crops, and famine reigned everywhere. Even in the early 20th century, Abyssinians were still raiding other Africans and carrying off slaves. It was 1922 before the British had gained sufficient control in Tanganyika to stamp out slavery there. Arabs were the leading slave raiders in East Africa, ranging over an area larger than all of Europe. The total number of slaves exported from East Africa during the 19th century has been estimated to be at least 2 million. Despite the impression created by Roots, during the era of the massive slave trade from West Africa, a white man was more likely to catch malaria in Africa than to catch slaves himself. The average life expectancy of a white man in the interior of sub-Saharan Africa at that time was less than one year. By and large, men from Europe or the Western Hemisphere came to the coasts of Africa, bought their slaves, and left as soon as possible. Even so, the death rates among the white crews of the ships carrying slaves to the Western Hemisphere were as high as the death rates among the slaves themselves. It was only much later, after quinine and other medical measures enabled Europeans to survive where there were tropical diseases, was it possible for them to invade Africa in force and establish empires there. But by then, the Atlantic slave trade had already been ended. During the era of that trade, Africa was largely ruled by Africans, who established the conditions under which slave sales took place. The crew of a slave ship was in no position to defy African rulers and their armies by going out across the land and capturing people willy-nilly. The stronger African peoples captured and enslaved the weaker peoples. The same pattern found over the centuries in Europe, Asia, the Western Hemisphere, and Polynesia. It's easy to see how people can deny this because when you just imagine that the oppressor came and captured slaves, the picture that is painted in your mind is that they went in willy-nilly and just captured people. But when you put things in context, in perspective, in the reality on the ground, you realize that things are not always just as simple as that. In the Asa land, the Ngoni and Yao swaggered over and terrorized other tribes. In Uganda, the Baganda made life miserable for their neighbors and the Nioro and Hima of Anko enslaved Toro women and children. The Tutsi dominated the Hutu in Rwanda, the Maasai lorded it over the Kikuyu and Kamba, and the latter, in turn, held the Indorobo in a kind of serfdom. 
It was precisely the fact that Europeans, except for the Portuguese, seldom participated in the raids that captured and enslaved Africans that enabled most people in Europe and the Americas to remain oblivious to the traumatic experience that this was, with some Africans committing suicide to avoid capture and wives being whipped as they tried to cling to their husbands or children. Historian David Brian Davis pointed out that Europeans had little contact with the actual process of enslavement, and that as late as 1721, the Royal African Company asked its agents to investigate the modes of enslavement in the interior. Europeans typically saw only the end results, enslaved people being offered for sale on the coast. It was much the same story in the Ottoman Empire, where those who bought slaves had no idea what these slaves had been through before. In the debate about slavery and reparations today, there's always a question of why do these activists give no thought or don't even care a little bit about present-day slaves. And it's for this same reason that they were not in touch with the reality on the ground. And that is the same thing that happens, that when you go out there and you buy your chocolate and you're having a good bite and enjoying it, you have no clue about the children that are enslaved in West Africa, in Ivory Coast, in Ghana, to go and pick this cocoa for child labor so that the prices can be super low for the manufacturing companies. And so you can have your chocolate and enjoy it the way you're enjoying it. When you step out there and you buy your EV and you say, wow, I'm going green, I'm saving the planet, you are not in touch with the reality and the context of the children in the Democratic Republic of Congo who have to, under very, very horrific conditions, dig out the cobalt and minerals that are necessary for manufacturing the batteries in your EV. But as far as you're not in touch with that and you're kind of encapsulated from the reality, you can just enjoy your stuff quietly. And that is the same reality in the past. So if you fast forward 100 years from today, your great-grandchildren will also say, why were you so wicked to buy your EVs and your chocolate and not give a thought to the slaves that were making this happen? Would they be justified in blaming you? One thing that is important to note that this is no way saying that the entire Roots movie or the book is uh, wrong and shouldn't be taken into consideration. The author himself said he wasn't so much of trying to be historically accurate to the details as much as he was trying to give his people hope, uh, a myth to live by, uh, a kind of fictional superhero kind of experience. So maybe it's a conspiracy or maybe it was just intended to be that way, not necessarily super accurate, but then some people have pushed it to now say it is historical accurate facts, just so that they can grieve or raise hustle or cause division and polarization. That's where the problem is. So that is it for today for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you're new here. Thank you for watching and I'll be seeing you in the next video.